Ocean Gate. Ocean Gate Expeditions was a company founded by Stockton Rush and Guillermo Sonlin that offered to take tourists on deep sea dives for 250,000 USD per person. It's the first entry to this iceberg because it went extremely viral in June 2023 after an incident where Rush and a group of passengers went missing in a submersible called Titan during a dive to the wreckage of the Titanic. Horror and speculation as to what happened to them ensued, as well as perhaps a little mean-spirited at times. Memes poking fun at the absurdity of the situation, most notably making fun of the fact that the submersible was controlled by a Logitech video game controller. People went down a rabbit hole looking into the history of OceanGate, and discovered that CEO Stockton Rush had gone on record stating that he wanted to pass the bare minimum safety requirements for the submersible to make it as cheap as possible, and that he ignored warning signs from engineers about using carbon fiber for the hull. It was also discovered that they made it to the Titanic before, and that this wasn't even the first time that they've lost contact with the submersible. It was eventually concluded that Titan imploded during its descent due to imperceptible structural errors in the carbon fiber hull that had built up over previous dives, killing its passengers instantly. The whole situation is a tragedy because it could have been easily avoided at multiple points had they shown more responsibility and respect for the intense and dangerous conditions of the deep sea. As of making this video, OceanGate has continued to suspend all operations and the Titan submersible implosion serves as a sad cautionary tale of the hubris of man. Davy Jones' Name Origin If you've watched almost literally anything with pirates in it, you've probably heard of a place called Davy Jones' Locker, or sometimes Davy Jones himself is a character in the story, and you've probably asked yourself, where did Davy Jones come from anyway? One of the earliest literary citations of Davy Jones was from Tobias Moulton's Peregrine Pickle, written in 1751, and it states that according to sailors, Davy Jones is the fiend that presides over all the evil spirits of the deep. He's basically the Grim Reaper of the sea. Whereas the Grim Reaper is the personification of death, Davy Jones is the personification of death at sea. But if he's the spirit of the sea itself, why does he have an average sounding English name? Why name a threatening ocean demon David of all things? Well, as with many pieces of folklore, there isn't one definitive origin story of the Davy Jones myth, but there are a few proposed theoretical roots. Linguists and historians believe the name Jones to be a corruption of the biblical Jonah, who was swallowed by a whale, and that the name Davy was possibly inspired by Saint David of Wales, whose name was often invoked by Welsh sailors. They also believe that the name could have come from what's known as a duppy, a word from Caribbean folklore that's believed to have been derived from West Africa. The word made its way into the Caribbean, namely Jamaica and Barbados, through the slave trade, and was used to refer to malevolent spirits or demonic beings. This word later evolved into Duffy, which then evolved into Davy, making Davy Jones a combination of European and Caribbean superstitions. If you're at all familiar with biblical lore, you'd know that the prophet Jonah lived inside a whale for three days, and was able to continue his life after the whale spit him out. But in Obia beliefs, it is generally believed that the soul has two parts, the good soul and the earthly soul. When a person dies, the good soul passes on to the afterlife, and the earthly soul continues to reside in the body for up to nine days after death. But if proper funerary rites are not followed, then there is a chance that the earthly spirit might escape and become a duppy, a shadow of its former self that can inhabit specific locations. According to this theory, some may have interpreted that Jonah's earthly soul became a duppy of the Caribbean Sea, and they refer to it as Duppy Jonah. Sometime after, Duppy Jonah changed into Duffy Jonah, and European sailors must have picked it up and transformed it into Davy Jones. Duffy Jonah, Duffy Jonah, Davy Jones. You can start to see the evolutionary through line of each of these names, especially if we add another link like Davy Jonah or Duffy Jones. Unfortunately, this is still just conjecture, as there aren't any recorded instances of Duffy Jonah or Duffy Jonah out there. At the end of the day, we don't really know the true origins of the Davy Jones legend. Kappa. The Kappa is a mythical river monster from Japanese folklore. They are depicted as short green humanoid turtle creatures with a bald spot or dish on their head called a sara. 
They are a mischievous and loathsome race. They kidnap children, they eat people, they steal from people, they look up women's skirts, they cheat, lie, abuse, murder, drink blood, steal people's souls through their anus, and just overall be a menace to people. Well, not all the time at least. They sometimes help farmers and fishers, and are supposedly pretty good doctors. But if you need to defend yourself against a kappa, you can trick it to spill the water in the dish on its head. Or you can fart on it. But be warned, they do have three anuses that allow them to pass three times as much gas as humans. They also served as inspiration for the Koopa Troopa enemy in Super Mario. You know, growing up, man, I spent hours of my life stomping. Flying Dutchman. The Flying Dutchman is a ghost ship that is doomed to sail the Seven Seas forever, and is the most popular ghost ship in history. The legend originated in the 17th century, and has been allegedly seen in real life, with its first sighting appearing in John MacDonald's Travels in Various Parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa during a series of 30 years and upwards, in 1790. In the legend, the Dutchman is considered a harbinger of death and impending doom for all those who have seen it. It brings with it hurricanes and deadly storms wherever it goes. The crew of the ship seem to have been put into this purgatory because they have all committed some kind of dreadful sin. It's made appearances in just about any form of media you could think of. Like I said, it's the most popular ghost ship, and there are still people that claim to have seen it to this day. Lady Lovabond the Lady Lovabond was a legendary three-mast schooner that set sail from Kent, England to Oporto, Portugal on February 13th, 1748. The captain had just been married and this voyage was a honeymoon for him and his wife. One crewmate, the first mate, was jealous of the captain and sabotaged the ship by intentionally steering it into the Goodwin Sands, killing everybody on board. But it's said that the Lady Lovabond continues on as a ghost ship that appears every 50 years off the coast of southeast England. There aren't any contemporary records of the ship or its sinking that have been discovered, and some speculate that the story of the ship might have been invented for Valentine's Day. But there are those that swear that they have seen the ship, still on its way to Portugal to this very day. USS Johnston the USS Johnston is a United States World War II naval vessel that was sunk during the Battle of Samar, and is the world's deepest known shipwreck. The wreck lies at a depth of 21,180 feet, and it was first mapped and filmed on March 31st, 2021. The ship was captained by Commander Ernest Evans, a Native American man from Oklahoma, who tragically died in the battle along with 185 members of his crew. Afterwards, Evans became the first Native American in the Navy to be awarded the Medal of Honor. Whirlpools and Maelstroms Whirlpools are vortexes of rotating water that are caused by two or more opposing currents, or a current running into an obstacle. Maelstroms are essentially the same thing, except they're larger and more dangerous. They usually form in narrow straits, and at the base of waterfalls. Whirlpools that form underwater and don't affect the surface are called eddies. Whirlpools often drag objects to the seabed, so they've joined the ranks of quicksand as things that you were afraid of happening to you when you were a small kid, even though the odds of you ending up in that situation are statistically small. Chilean Blob The Chilean Blob was a large globster found on Penuno Beach in Los Muermos, Chile. It was 39 feet long and weighed 14 tons. Its story is similar to many other beach carcasses. It was initially unable to be identified, leading to speculation that it was an undiscovered species of cephalopod. Later on, fragments of the DNA were found to belong to a sperm whale. Jacuzzi of Despair The Jacuzzi of Despair is a deadly brine pool in the Gulf of Mexico that kills anything that swims into it. It's 3,300 feet below the surface, is 100 feet in circumference, and is 12 feet deep. The water in it is five times saltier than the surrounding seawater, and is also composed of chemicals like methane and hydrogen sulfide, making it extremely toxic to any creatures unlucky enough to enter it, as it kills them and mummifies their bodies. This is one example of one of those underwater lakes I brought up in the first episode. They are usually formed by layers of salt that were buried under layers of sediment, 
After some time, the seawater and the ocean pressure uncover the salt and create a pool of brine that's too dense to mix with the water around it, giving it the appearance of an underwater lake or river. Living Fossils Living fossils are animals that appear unchanged from their extinct fossil relatives. Possibly the biggest example of a marine living fossil is the coelacanth, a fish species that stretches back to the Devonian period 410 million years ago. It was once believed that coelacanths had gone extinct at the same time as the dinosaurs, but in 1938 a living specimen was dredged up from the deep, barely any different from its ancestors who lived millions of years ago. Other examples of marine living fossils include the horseshoe crab, crinoids, the ghost shark, the nautilus, and the goblin shark. Living fossils usually do continue to change and evolve, but on a level that is imperceptible to the human eye. The slow rates of evolution in these marine species are likely a result of the relatively stable environment underwater, particularly in the deep sea. By G. River Dolphin On the flip side of the coelacanth, being an animal believed to have been extinct only for us to find a living specimen, the Baiji, or Chinese river dolphin, was an animal that we know existed alongside us, but has been pronounced extinct. They lived in China's Yangtze River, and kept together in small groups of about two to six. They had poor eyesight, and so they used echolocation to navigate and to hunt. This became a challenge to them, as the Yangtze River was developed and became a route used for thousands of ships, increasing the noise pollution of the river. Things would only get worse for the Baijis. As in 1994, construction of the Three Gorges Dam began, causing large-scale environmental damage to the Yangtze. This combined with the threats caused by fishing and pollution spelled certain doom for the Baiji species, and they quickly became one of the most endangered animals on Earth. Preservation efforts to save the dolphin began, but it seemed to have been too late, as in 2006 an international research team failed to find any evidence of surviving Baiji in the river concluding that the Chinese river dolphin may now be extinct. Since then, there haven't been any documented sightings of the river dolphin beyond a few sparse, unverified claims. Even if these claims were true, it's sadly unlikely that the few dolphins sighted would be able to perpetuate the survival of the species for much longer. Cadborosaurus The Cadborosaurus was a plesiosaur-like creature that supposedly lived off the British Columbian coast. During the 1800s, people in the Pacific Northwest claimed to have witnessed a large sea monster off the coast, particularly in Kedboro Bay. Descriptions say that it had a camel-like head with a hump back. It was given the name Cadborosaurus in 1933 by journalist Archie H. Wills, but many just like to call him Caddy. In the early 1990s, a photograph from 1937 of a Cadborosaurus carcass had resurfaced. The carcass had been extracted from the stomach of a sperm whale, and it was about 10 feet long and seemingly possessed both reptilian and mammalian characteristics, with a horse-like head and a spiny tail fin. The animal in the photo has yet to be definitively identified, but it's likely to be a carcass of an already known species, like a sturgeon or a basking shark. It's always either a sperm whale or a basking shark. Rogue Waves Rogue waves are massive waves that show up suddenly and unpredictably. They are extremely rare, and because of this we have been unable to effectively study them, so we don't exactly know what causes them or when they form. They were believed to be scientifically implausible until January 1st, 1995, when one was recorded by the Dropner oil drilling platform. It's possible that they are caused by swells colliding into each other, but rogue waves ultimately serve as a reminder of how unpredictable weather disasters can be. Octopolis and Octlantis Octopolis and Octlantis are two settlements created by gloomy octopuses in Jervis Bay, Australia, discovered in 2009 and 2016 respectively. The octopuses built dens for themselves in these locations using shells and man-made scraps. Both of these underwater cities are home to about 15 octopuses each. This is significant because gloomy octopuses are typically believed to be solitary creatures. This could be evidence that they are more social than initially believed. But it's also possible that these areas are such good real estate for burrowing that they don't mind having a few neighbors. Deep Blue Great White 
Deep Blue is a female great white shark that marine biologists have been tracking for nearly 30 years. And she's one of the largest sharks known to date at about 20 feet long and weighing about 2.5 tons. She's about 50 years old and has another good 20 years of her life ahead of her, as great white sharks have a life expectancy of about 70 years. She hasn't been tagged, so instead she is tracked by researchers finding her in the spots that she returns to year after year. Eltonin Antenna The Eltonin Antenna was a strange object photographed on the sea floor by the USNS Eltonin in 1964 while researching the waters near Cape Horn, South America. It was found at a depth of 3,904 meters and its artificial upright appearance and antenna-like structure have puzzled many. It might look man-made, but if so, how did it end up in the deep ocean while staying upright? This led some to speculate that it might be a piece of alien technology left behind by extraterrestrial beings. But for what purpose? I don't know, why don't you ask the aliens? But they probably won't know what you're talking about, because the antenna is most likely a sponge. A carnivorous sponge. This sponge, Clatteriza concrescens, has a long stem with small bulb-like appendages, giving it an appearance very similar to the Eltonin antenna. These appendages are covered with tiny hooks that catch small crustaceans and other invertebrates that the sponge feeds on by enveloping them with a thin membrane, then slowly digesting them. Carnivorous sponges can grow into many different shapes that seem very alien to us. But even so, there are still those out there that swear that the Eltonin antenna is something other than a sponge. Isle of Demons I love Demon. The Isle of Demons is a phantom island in Canada that appeared on many maps, mostly in the 16th century. As the name suggests, it was rumored to be populated by demons and beasts that would attack anybody that ventured onto the island. It's also part of a ghost story that real-life French noblewoman, Marguerite de la Roque, was marooned on the island alongside a man she allegedly had an affair with. The legend states that their ghostly visages can still be seen to this day. In the 17th century, the Isle of Demons stopped appearing on maps, and it's believed that the island said to be the Isle of Demons is either Kirpon Island or Harrington Harbor. The Isle of Demons isn't unlike most phantom islands, but the ghost stories associated with it make it stand out. El Gran Maha El Gran Maha is a hypothetical sea monster created by YouTube animator Borisau Blois. It sort of exists as the answer to the question, if the bloop sound came from a giant creature, what if there was an even bigger creature? It's since become something of a viral power scaling meme, with videos of it fighting the bloop or other kaijus like Godzilla. I haven't really heard of it before, but these videos are gaining millions of views. It's like the skibbity toilet of the sea. Corkscrew Seal Killings Around the mid-1990s, it was found that harbor seals with bizarre corkscrew-shaped wounds would continuously wash up around Sable Island, Nova Scotia. For the longest time, it was unknown what was killing these seals, as their unusual wounds seemed too clean to be made by an animal and the cuts didn't go any deeper than the seal's skin and blubber. Plus, Sable Island was a protected island far away from human civilization, and the killings happened frequently enough that it seemed unlikely for them to have been intentionally killed by humans. These seal carcasses were also found around St. Andrews, Scotland. It was originally thought that these injuries were caused by boat propellers, but boat propeller engines usually just create a single gash, rather than the spiral pattern found on the bodies. Certain propellers can theoretically cause a corkscrew gash if the seal swam close enough to get sucked into its intake. But this seems unlikely. Some suspected that Greenland sharks were what was killing the seals, as Greenland sharks have small teeth that could be capable of making these wounds as they shake their head to tear up their prey, combined with the seal's instinct to spin around to escape its grasp. But some of these seals were found in waters warmer than the Greenland shark's preferred habitat, and Greenland sharks aren't very active predators. This debate on what could be causing the killings persisted, until researchers observed an adult male gray seal killing a pup. When the body was cleaned up and observed, they found that it had a wound very similar to the corkscrew pattern found on the bodies in question. 
After nearly two decades of this phenomenon occurring, it seemed like the culprit was found. But even this explanation has holes in it. As there is no evidence of male gray seals causing corkscrew injuries to other adult seals, only pups. None of these explanations are definitive, and there are still proponents of all three theories. Some believe that propellers, Greenland sharks, and cannibalism are all causes, and that each coincidentally leaves a similar corkscrew scar across the body. But there's no consensus on what's the main cause, or why it seemingly has only been observed in the last 27 years. Golden Orb On August 30th, 2023, Noah found a strange biological specimen in the Gulf of Alaska. They retrieved it and brought it to the surface to be analyzed. They don't currently know exactly what it is, so it could be a newly discovered species or a newly discovered stage of a known species. That's about it, it's a little too new to get much information on it. Sorry. Whales are changing their sounds. Humpback whales actually change their song every year throughout their lives. It isn't exactly clear why they do this, but it's thought to be an evolutionary development to distinguish themselves when attracting females. It's also been found that whales shorten or stop singing their songs when ships pass by, further suggesting a negative impact of commercial ships on marine life's ability to communicate. Jayapura Seawall The Jayapura Seawall was a Google Earth anomaly found off the northern coast of the island of Papa, Indonesia. It had the appearance of a massive straight 110 km long wall, with an estimated height of 1,860 meters nearly double the height of the Dubai Tower. You can't see it anymore, as it was removed in 2012, and the unbelievable size of the structure has led to the conclusion that it was a visual glitch. Atlantis Eye of the Sahara This is a theory that the lost city of Atlantis is actually the Eye of the Sahara, also known as the Rishat structure. For those that don't know, the Rishat structure is a massive geological dome that is 25 miles in diameter. Everything about it suggests that it's a natural geological formation, but some believe it to actually be Atlantis, because of the feature's visual resemblance to written descriptions of Atlantis's capital city. There is some more evidence for this beyond surface-level visual comparisons. For example, the names Atlantes or Atlantia show up in West Africa on maps allegedly created by the ancient Romans. There's also some studies that suggest that the Rishat structure was formed through hydrothermal means, showing that it was possibly filled with water, like the capital city of Atlantis. There are also the remains of a dried up saltwater lake, and an ancient river that ran very close to the structure, possibly being remnants of whatever cataclysm wiped out the city. However, many say that the geography of Plato's original story defines Atlantis as an island or group of islands, and puts it out in the Atlantic, closer to the Azores, not on the continent of Africa. Also, radar and analysis of the reshot formation shows that it's a deep-rooted volcanic feature, not the remains of man-made structures. There are many different proposed ideas of where Atlantis was and what happened to it. But one thing that's clear is that the story of Atlantis, and the speculation that it creates, will never truly die. Marine Saurian The Marine Saurian is a crocodile-like cryptid found in the open ocean, mostly in tropical or subtropical waters off New Zealand. It's theorized to be a surviving Thaletosuchian, or Mosasaur from the Jurassic or Cretaceous period. Possibly the 60-foot crocodile creature from Part 1 was one of these. There's no evidence of that, but it would be pretty cool. Ice Finger of Death The Ice Finger of Death, also known as a brinicle, is a phenomenon where sea ice leaks brine into the ocean beneath it, allowing the water around it to freeze and form a porous icicle. Occasionally, a brinicle may reach the sea floor, and when it does, it continues to grow, freezing over everything around it, including bottom-dwelling animals like starfish and sea urchins. Hence the Ice Finger of Death nickname. Titanic Didn't Sink The sinking of the RMS Titanic is the most well-known maritime disaster in history, but this theory posits that it wasn't the Titanic that sunk, but rather its sister ship, the Olympic. 
Not only that, but it was sunk on purpose. The story goes that after the Olympic got into a small accident, American investment banker and owner of the Titanic, J.P. Morgan, discovered that he would get more money through insurance fraud by intentionally destroying the ship. So he decided to swap the Olympic with a near-identical Titanic, and sink it out in the middle of the Atlantic. Even though it would probably be easier to set the Olympic on fire one night while it was at port, and blame it on a boiler malfunction or something, and also avoid the loss of more than 1,500 people and hundreds of thousands of 1912 dollars worth of cargo. But it wasn't just about the money. J.P. Morgan was a proponent of the U.S. Federal Reserve, which had yet to be put in place, and he had three alleged business enemies that opposed the Federal Reserve and were going on the Titanic's maiden voyage. So he had another reason to sink the ship. Murder. Even though Isidore Strauss, one of the three people alleged to be against the Federal Reserve, had actually publicly expressed support for it, and the other two never gave an opinion on it. And the Federal Reserve had the support of many people and institutions who had been working on it and pushing it for years. So even if these two guys did oppose it and survive their voyage on the Titanic, Morgan still would have gotten what he wanted, and the Federal Reserve would have gone into effect anyway. So Morgan cancelled his trip with the Titanic just before it set sail, because he had thought up this scheme months earlier, but forgot to cancel his tickets back then. He murdered over a thousand innocents in the name of greed, and he got away with it for more than a century, until genius TikTok influencers finally exposed his deeds to the world. Godspeed. Strange Holes in Arctic Sea Ice In 2018, mysterious holes were spotted from an airplane over Greenland, as part of NASA's Operation Ice Bridge program, to document changes in the polar regions. But NASA scientists were unsure what caused these holes. One thought explanation was that they could have been gnawed out by seals as the holes are similar to breathing holes created by ring seals and harp seals. They also thought that it could just be warmer water finding its way to the surface through currents, which has been observed to cause similar holes to appear. Organism 46-B Organism 46-B is an alleged 33-foot-long squid-like cephalopod-type creature with 14 arms that lives in Lake Vostok, a subglacial lake located under two miles of ice in the Antarctic. According to the story, in 1974, the Soviet Union had discovered that Vostok Station actually sat on top of a massive body of water that was hidden beneath two miles of ice. After more than 30 years of drilling, they were able to make it to the lake on February 5, 2012. Then they came into contact with Organism 46-B, which somehow disabled their radios and released its venom into the water, which paralyzed and killed some of the researchers. It also had shape-shifting abilities, able to give itself the appearance of a human diver, and psychic abilities, able to disable electronics and even seemingly mind control one of the researchers. They were somehow able to capture the creature and extract it from the lake in a tank. But the Russian government covered it up and denied that anything was found in Lake Vostok. But it's claimed that they intend to weaponize the creature possibly by depositing its eggs in lakes and reservoirs across North America. As you've probably put together already, this story is fake. It was written by fiction author C. Michael Forsyth for a Supernatural News satire website. As a story, I like the concept, but it really doesn't go into enough detail for me to call it a good creepypasta. Like, it doesn't even explain how the frick they even capture the monster, despite it being so powerful and intelligent. The story goes from saying, From the way it adapted each time we changed our tactics, we became convinced that it was at least as intelligent as an average human. To, Miraculously, the eggheads were able to capture the creature in a tank. Bitch! This creature has psychic capabilities and is able to excrete poison that paralyzes you if you even touch it, and it can shoot it at you from 150 feet away. How did they put it in a box and take it away? You can't just say, miraculously, the eggheads got him. Somehow Palpatine returned. Literally Rise of Skywalker tier writing. See me after class. Blue Hole Deaths 
The Blue Hole is a diving location on the Sinai Peninsula in the Red Sea, and it's a deep sinkhole with a maximum depth of 328 feet or 100 meters. It also has the most deaths of any dive site, with estimates of about 8 deaths per year. It's a very popular free diving destination thanks to its close distance from the shore, and because of a submerged tunnel that goes out into the Red Sea called the Arch that's at a depth of 170 feet. Diving in the Blue Hole itself isn't any more dangerous than diving at any other place in the Red Sea, but passing through the Arch is a challenge to unequipped divers as the Arch lies at a depth beyond the generally considered limit for recreational diving. There are many things that can go wrong when trying to dive through the Arch. You could not pack enough breathing gas to safely pass through, experience nitrogen narcosis making it even harder to navigate the already demanding tunnel, fail to make the decompression stops necessary to avoid decompression sickness, or you could even miss the arch entirely and dive deeper than is necessary. These conditions have led to the tragically sad deaths of many divers. And because of this, the Egyptian Chamber for Diving and Water Sports now ensures that people dive with a certified guide to make sure safety procedures are followed. Kitesh Kitesh is a mythical city hidden in Lake Svetloyer in central Russia. It originates from an 18th century book called the Kitesh Chronicle, written by an unknown author, but it's thought to have come from the Old Believers, an offshoot of Orthodox Christianity that separated after the Reformation. It is written that the Grand Prince of Vladimir Georgi II built the town of Mali Katesh or Little Katesh on the bank of the Volga River. Then he built the town of Bolshoi Katesh or Great Katesh on the shore of Lake Svetloyar. Years passed and the Mongols attacked Katesh. They were able to take Mali Katesh and Georgi retreated to Bolshoi Katesh. When the Mongols advanced on the town, they were surprised to find that instead of an army ready to fight to protect the town, they were faced with civilians praying to God for salvation. The Mongols rushed to attack, but retreated when fountains of water burst out of the ground and submerged the city in the lake. Folk tales say that only those who are pious and pure in heart can find Katesh, and on occasion people can hear voices singing hymns from beneath the surface of the lake. USS Nimitz UFO the USS Nimitz UFO refers to an official declassified U.S. government video of an encounter with a Navy fighter jet and an unidentified aerial phenomenon, as it's called nowadays. The encounter happened in 2004, around the USS Nimitz aircraft carrier. The footage shows an oblong pill-shaped object flying above the ocean, then suddenly accelerating out of view at an unprecedented velocity. More videos would be taken of similar objects in 2014 and 2015 by other Navy personnel, and the videos would be formally released by the Pentagon on April 27, 2020. The release of these videos would encourage others to come forward with their stories of what they saw. Retired Navy Commander David Fravor described the object as a little white tic-tac that moved extremely fast over the ocean. It was about the size of a fighter jet, but it had no wings, no markings, no exhaust plumes, and it was able to descend 80,000 feet in less than a second. The government has confirmed that more footage of similar UAPs exists, but will not release it for fears that it may provide potential enemies with valuable information regarding Navy operations or vulnerabilities. Ghost Ship of Northumberland Strait the ghost ship of Northumberland Strait is a flaming ship that's said to be sailing the Northumberland Strait in Canada. Reports vary on what exactly it looks like. Sometimes it's a square rigger and sometimes it's a topsail schooner. But it's always a sailing vessel and it's always on fire. People say that when you see it, you can hear the crew of the ship panicking, and you might even see them climbing up the mass of the ship until the ship completely burns away. If you want to maybe get a look at it yourself, it's most likely to appear at dusk or just before daybreak in spring and fall. Ipupiara Ipupiara is a monster that was part of the mythology of the Tupi Guarini people who inhabited Brazil. It's a monstrous, river, hairy, merman-like creature that attacks and eats fishermen. It's also said that it's known to crush its victims to death with its arms. It's related to Iara, the mother of the waters. She is described as a beautiful young woman, with green hair, light brown skin, brown eyes, and has a tail like a river dolphin. It's said that she was once a human who had a talent for warfare, gaining the envy of her brothers. This caused them to try to murder her, and she killed them in self-defense. The people of the tribe didn't believe her, and drowned her in the river for punishment. 
She was saved by the night goddess Yasi, and turned into a mermaid who would take revenge by acting as a siren by luring men to their death in the river. It's believed that the legend of Iara is derivative of the myth of Ipupiara that evolved after the colonization of Brazil. Red Blood Lake There are many lakes around the world that sometimes turn blood red. This is usually caused by microorganisms and algae that thrive under certain conditions. For example, this blood lake, Lake Ermia, on the border of Iran and Turkey, was a byproduct of algae in the lake that thrives on salt and light. As water levels receded in the summer of 2016, the concentration of salt in the water went up, causing the algae to gain the upper hand in the ecosystem. This algae is called Dunaliella salina, and in conditions of high salinity and light intensity, it turns red, due to the production of carotenoids in the cells. Similar events can happen in other bodies of water for similar reasons. For example, the O.C. Fisher Reservoir in Texas turned red in 2011 because of the chromatis because of chromatisi chromatis because of the chromatisiaceae bacteria that flourished after the oxygen levels of the water dropped. And the Great Salt Lake is an ideal environment for archaea that occasionally turns the water a pinkish hue. This phenomenon has seen an increase due to climate change causing the water levels in lakes to decrease, increasing the concentration of salt within them, making it easier for these microorganisms to survive, but harder for fish and other animals to live in these lakes. Alvin Plesiosaur The Alvin Plesiosaur, or the Alvin Sea Serpent, was a cryptid claimed to have been spotted by the Alvin Submersible in 1965. Alleged eyewitnesses Marvin McCannis and Bill Rainey saw the serpent while piloting the Alvin Submersible in the tongue of the ocean, a region of water in the Bahamas that's much deeper than the surrounding ocean. They were 5,000 feet below the surface, inside a crevice, when it looked like the walls of the trench were moving. They checked for drift, but found that the sub was stationary. They then drove the sub away to get a better view at what was moving, and saw a large creature with flippers and a long neck with a snake-like head. It swam out of range before they could get a picture. This story comes from the book Without a Trace by Charles Berlitz, the author who originally popularized the Bermuda Triangle. However, Berlitz has been criticized before for ignoring possible natural explanations to promote pseudoscientific ideas. And since I can't find any other sources of this story that don't go back to this book, it's hard to see this story as reliable evidence of the existence of living plesiosaurs. Sea Monkeys so monkeys are pretty cool, right? Well, wouldn't it be cool if we had monkeys, but underwater? Well, it looks like we can. Wait, hold on, this is a total scam. These are just brine shrimp, a genus of small crustaceans that thrive in saltwater lakes and are able to live in waters with much higher salinity than most other living organisms. Oh well, perhaps one day the dream of finding the elusive underwater monkey will be realized. Jian Singh the Jiansang was a tanker ship of unknown origin that was found in the Gulf of Carpentaria in 2006. There were no records of a distress signal or reports of a missing boat beforehand. There wasn't anyone or anything on the boat when it was found. No identifying documents, no personal belongings, nothing. The only things investigators had to go on was the name Jiansang on the side of the ship and a broken tow rope, leading them to believe that the ship was being towed by another ship and broke free, explaining why there was nothing on board. Since no owner of the ship could be found, it was brought out to deep waters and scuttled. Giant Goblin Sharks It used to be believed that the goblin shark was a mid-sized shark with a maximum length of 12 feet, but this all changed when two goblin sharks were found in the Gulf of Mexico at about 20 feet. So far, these have been the only two goblin sharks of this size discovered, leading to the possibility that this is unique to the sharks of the Gulf of Mexico. But fossil records show that goblin sharks were once even bigger than that, with estimates that they could grow up to 24.7 feet or 7.54 meters, even longer than the largest recorded great white. This points to a possibility that goblin sharks and other marine animals may grow even larger than we realize. Limnic Eruptions Limnic eruptions, or lake overturns, are a very rare type of natural disaster, 
where dissolved carbon dioxide erupts from deep lakes, forming a gas cloud that can kill any animal within it. They can also cause the lake to flood the surrounding area, as the rising CO2 displaces the water. A few conditions have to be met for a lake to be considered limnically active. They have to have CO2 saturated incoming water, a cool lake bottom, and an upper and lower thermal layer with differing CO2 saturations. These all cause the CO2 at the bottom of the lake to build up pressure, and eventually explode out of the lake after volcanic activity, earthquakes, or another event allows the gas to escape. There have been two limnic eruptions in recent history, both in Cameroon. The first occurred at Lake Manown in 1984, killing 37 people by asphyxiation. The second occurred at Lake Neos in 1986, and it killed more than 1,700 people and 3,000 livestock. Paleodiction Paleodiction is a fossil with no known origin found in marine areas. The fossil is made of these strange honeycomb-like patterns. We've even found modern specimens of the same patterns in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but haven't found the animal that created them. Something has been making these patterns in the ocean for millions of years, but we aren't sure exactly what. It's thought that the creature that created these fossils, referred to as Paleodiction nodesum, are either ancient sponges, xenophyophores, or sea worms. It's thought by some that the honeycombs are burrows created by these worms to either catch food or to farm its own food like leafcutter ants. But the sharp angles of the Paleodiction fossils are unlikely to have been made by a burrowing organism, giving some evidence to the sponge or xenophyophore hypothesis. But ultimately there's nothing conclusive until we find a living specimen inside one of these burrows. Pensacola Sea Serpent on March 24, 1962, then 16-year-old Edward Brian McCleary and his four friends were reportedly attacked by a sea serpent off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. They set off to explore the shipwreck of the USS Massachusetts in a 7-foot Air Force life raft when they were suddenly pulled out to sea by a storm. Then after the storm died down, a thick fog rolled in. In the fog, it looked like a 10-foot tall telephone pole sticking out of the water before it dove beneath the surface. In a panic, the five boys decided to abandon the raft to try to make it to the semi-submerged wreck of the Massachusetts as fast as possible. While they were trying to make a break for it, the serpent would pick them off one by one. Edward McCleary was the sole survivor of this attack. In researching this, I was able to find a news article reporting their disappearance, but it doesn't mention anything about a sea serpent. It also quotes McCleary as saying that he and a couple of his friends had developed cramps and were separated. According to McCleary, the newspaper omitted his story, as it would have been seen as disrespectful to publish such a wild, unprovable claim shortly after their deaths. The Sea Serpent story wasn't published until May of 1965 in Fate magazine, a magazine about paranormal phenomena. There's a few possibilities we can glean from this. One, the story is true and Fate Magazine was the only source to publish it. Two, McCleary and his friends mistook something else for a sea monster, and they drowned due to other causes like the previously mentioned cramps. Or three, McCleary made up the story later on, and told it to the one magazine that he knew would publish it without too much questioning. Sadly, Edward Brian McCleary died in 2016, so we'll never know which is true for sure. Underground Ocean New scientific findings show that there may be a large amount of water located between the upper and lower mantle of the Earth. The evidence is a rare diamond that was found in Botswana. When analyzed, researchers found that it was formed in the transition zone between Earth's upper and lower mantle, and it contained ringwoodite, a mineral that is very good at soaking up water. And this ringwoodite had hydrous phases, which indicate that the diamond was formed in a wet environment. If these findings are accurate, it could mean that the existence of a massive underground ocean is within the realm of possibility. Western Pacific Biotwang The Western Pacific Biotwang is a strange metallic sound that was recorded multiple times near the Mariana Trench in 2014. It was later thought to have been a new call of baleen whales, 
more specifically minke whales, as the biotwang's frequency matches closely to that of minke whales. Plus, minke whales make some very strange metallic sounds. But there are enough differences between the two sounds to make this inconclusive, as we won't know for sure until we have enough data to confirm that minke whales are what's making this noise. Marvin the Invertebrate Marvin the Invertebrate, or more commonly known as Marvin the Monster, is an unidentified serpentine creature that was photographed by the Shell Oil Company's ROV Mobot off the Pacific coast of the United States in February 1962. It's estimated from the footage that Marvin was 15 feet long and 6 inches in diameter. It moved in a corkscrew-like fashion, and it looked to be a colonial organism like a satenophore or a siphonophore, but it ultimately went unidentified. These two frames of film and some newspaper articles are the only publicly available evidence of this creature's existence. Praia Dubaya One of the bigger candidates for what Marvin was is Praia Dubaya, also known as the giant siphonophore. But Marvin was probably something different, as Praia Dubaya lives at a depth of 2,300 feet to 3,300 feet, way deeper than the depth that Marvin was recorded. And the giant siphonophore is way longer too with a length up to 160 feet. This rivals the blue whale, making it one of the longest animals on Earth, only being surpassed by the bootlace worm, which can grow up to be 180 feet long. Like other siphonophores, it isn't a single organism, but rather it's made up by a colony of tiny organisms called zooids. The large dome-like thing at the end of it is called a pneumatophore, and it acts as a float that allows the siphonophore to stay at its preferred depth. Trieste fish. The Trieste fish was a deep sea fish spotted by the pilots of the Trieste bathysphere. The Trieste bathysphere is an Italian built submersible vehicle and was the first ever manned vehicle ever to reach Challenger Deep in 1960. While they were down there, one of the pilots, Jacques Picard, saw an unidentified flatfish on the sea floor. It was about a foot long and six inches across with two round eyes on the top of its head. He watched as it slowly swam away and disappeared in the darkness. He pointed out how strange it was that this fish seemingly had eyes as there isn't exactly a lot of light that gets down there. Don Walsh, the sub's other pilot, has also said to have seen the fish, although he says that they saw it before landing on the sea floor, because after they landed the sand that was kicked up made it impossible to see anything for the 20 minutes that they were down there. He also conceded that neither he or Picard were trained biologists, and could have easily mistaken what the creature actually was. Marine biologists have doubted that what they saw was actually a flatfish, as flatfish are rarely found beyond 1,000 meters deep, and the depth reached by Trieste was about 11,000 meters. This combined with the fact that they would have had a very small time frame to actually see the fish on the seafloor, makes it very likely that what they saw was a misidentification. Philadelphia Experiment The Philadelphia Experiment was a Navy experiment claimed to have been witnessed by an ex-merchant mariner named Carl M. Allen in 1943. He said that the USS Eldridge was being used to test one of Albert Einstein's lost unified field theories, and reverse-engineered UFO technology to see if they could make the ship invisible. At first it appeared that they were successful, but the ship had actually teleported to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes before teleporting back to the Philadelphia shipyard. When the ship returned, the crew had experienced several side effects. Some of them were left insane from the incident, while others were left invisible, frozen in place, or even fused to the ship or left intangible. Those that were frozen seemed to be in a comatose state where they could breathe, look and feel, but they did not move or experience time, and when they were unfrozen they had no memory of anything that happened while they were frozen. The Navy has denied that any such experiment has been conducted, and veterans that have served on the USS Eldridge have said that the ship never made port in Philadelphia. Plus, this experiment took place when the Eldridge was in the Bahamas, making this story widely believed to be a hoax. Hoover the Seal Remember No Sea? 
the beluga whale who could mimic him human speech. I can't mimic human speech. Remember No See, the beluga whale who could mimic human speech? Well, he's definitely not the first aquatic mammal to do so. Meet Hoover the seal, a harbor seal that was rescued and raised by George Swallow. George spent a lot of time with Hoover, basically treating him like his dog. As a result, Hoover caught on to the small phrases that George would say, like hello there and come over here, and he was able to repeat them in a very similar voice, even being able to mimic his accent. Because of this ability of his, Hoover lived the rest of his life being somewhat of an animal celebrity, appearing on TV and in various publications until his death on July 25th, 1985. Also, George gave him the name Hoover because of how he sucked down milk from a bottle like a Hoover branded vacuum. I need a new dust filter for my Hoover Max Extract Pressure Pro Model 60. Can you help me with that? Giant Leptocephalus. The Giant Leptocephalus, Colochondra giganteus, is an eel in the family Colochondridae, worm eels and short tail eels. It was described by Peter Henry John Castle in 1959. It is a marine deep water dwelling eel, which is distributed worldwide. This is the entire Wikipedia article for the giant leptocephalus. A leptocephalus is what we call the larva of an eel, so this may be one of many supposed super eels out there. For example, in 1930, the research vessel Donna found a six foot long creature that they believed to be an eel larva. If that was the case, then when this eel reached adulthood, it would have been absolutely massive, as six feet is longer than most adult eels. Could it be possible that this eel was responsible for all the mythical sea serpent sightings throughout history? Later on, it was thought to have been a misidentified deep sea spiny eel larva of the Nauticanthidae family, which are known to have larvae that grow as big or even bigger than adults at times. But as this re-identification happened over 50 years ago, some feel unsatisfied with the evidence and feel that the leptocephalus could still have belonged to an undiscovered eel species. Glowing Living Fire Hose On an internet message board in the year 2000, a guy said that he knew a guy who worked for Gulf Oil as a diver that would repair oil rigs in the 1970s. One day, this guy's friend saw what he described as a glowing living fire hose. It was a long serpentine creature without a noticeable head that glowed green and swam extremely fast. An intriguing story, but considering that this was the only reported sighting of something like this, it's possible that it was just a hallucination brought on by narcosis. Supposedly the other divers with him saw it as well, and they saw it multiple times. But I'm skeptical because of how unverifiable this story is, as it comes from someone who knew the guy that saw it and not from the guy himself. SS Caronda Giant Jellyfish In 1973, an Australian ship known as the Caronda collided with a giant jellyfish on its way through the South Pacific. The captain of the ship said that the tentacles of the jelly must have been over 200 feet long. The bell of the jellyfish was pulped on impact, leaving a slimy goo across the front of the ship. When samples of this jellyfish were tested, it was found to have been a lion's mane jellyfish, the largest known species of jellyfish in existence. They can grow up to 7 feet in diameter, and 120 feet long, so one being large enough to be mistaken for a monster is pretty likely. But this wasn't the only reported sighting of a giant jellyfish out there. In 1953, a deep sea diver in Australia claimed to have seen a massive jellyfish attack and eat a white tip shark. And in 1969, two more divers reported seeing another giant jellyfish that they said was somewhere between 50 to 100 feet in diameter, and was purple in color. Honestly, although some of these sightings sound too exaggerated to be true, I feel like the idea that a yet-to-be-discovered species of jellyfish larger than any other exists somewhere out there is well within the realm of possibility. Sycamore Knoll The Sycamore Knoll refers to a strange underwater feature off the coast of Malibu Beach in California. It's about three miles across and two miles wide, and when looked at on Google Earth, looks like a massive underwater building. Because of its appearance, people have called it an underwater UFO, like the Baltic Sea Anomaly. 
Some have even said that it's a secret alien base. So is this structure with unevenly spaced pillars that just so happens to be located on the continental shelf and can only be seen on Google Earth, a program that accidentally creates anomalies and misrepresents how things actually look because of the limited data sets truly be of extraterrestrial origin? I don't know. Why don't you ask the aliens? Mediterranean Serpent Skeleton In 2017, an ROV found what looked like a 30 meter long vertebral column in the Mediterranean. It's unidentified as this spine is much longer than any animal in the area. It's also unknown how old these bones are, so that makes it even harder to narrow down what they could have belonged to. It's possible that it belonged to something that lived thousands of years ago. We don't really know. Because of how the only thing that remained was a spine, many people's minds immediately jumped to thinking that it belonged to a sea serpent. But it also had what appeared to be a hip or tailbone as well. It's possible that it could belong to a basking shark, as shark spines can sometimes harden and fossilize. But that doesn't match with the 30 meter size estimate, although this estimate could have been exaggerated. Unfortunately, no samples of this skeleton were recovered, so we may never know exactly what it was. Deep Sea Abominable Snowman So a lot of the entries on this iceberg have been taken from this ocean cryptid chart by Truth is Scarier Than Fiction. And at first I thought this was some kind of joke entry, or that it was about a yeti crab or something. But during my research I found a part in the book without a trace, where a guy describes an encounter with what he called an underwater abominable snowman. Quote, We were south of Great Isaac Light, near the drop-off. I was looking at the bottom while I was being trolled along the line behind a 30-foot boat, built especially for diving and salvage work. I could see a sandy bottom at about 35 to 40 feet. I was deep enough to see ahead of the boat, and some sort of round turtle or big fish about 200 pounds became visible, and I went lower to get a good look. It turned and looked at me at a 20 degree angle. It had a monkey's face, with its head protruding out in front, a much longer neck than a turtle, four or more times the length of a human neck. It rotated its neck like a snake as it watched me. The eyes were like those of a human being, but enlarged. It looked like the face of a monkey with specially adapted eyes for underwater vision. When it got a good look at me, it took off using some form of propulsion that came from underneath." Close quote. So there we have it. The quest for finding an underwater monkey has finally come to a close. Wait, who wrote this book again? Yeah, tartar sauce. Also, special shout out to Alan Danker for reaching out to draw this visualization of the deep sea abominable snowman. Go check out his socials linked below, he does pretty good stuff. 1970s Titanic Wreck Discovery So the wreck of the Titanic was discovered on September 1st, 1985, right? Well this entry posits that the Titanic was actually found first almost a decade earlier in the 1970s. Allegedly in 1977, the British were conducting secret tests of deep sea underwater sonar equipment to one day use it in locating and detecting Russian submarines. During one of these tests, they detected two very large objects in the general vicinity of where the Titanic was found. Meaning that they possibly found the two halves of the Titanic years earlier, and either didn't fully realize it or kept it secret to not blow their cover. Candied Island There's a legendary island out there that's allegedly made entirely out of candy. Explorers say that there's lollipop trees and a lemonade sea. This has made the island one of the most sought after treasures in the world. Although now that I think of it, I don't think anybody's ever been to Candied Island. They say the journey to Candied Island is dangerous and risky, but adventurous and free. So if adventure is the life for you, you may be fortunate enough to find it and have as much candy as your heart desires. But if you ask me, who needs Candied Island? It's safer at the docks. Living Trilobite Tracks Although there are no sightings of living trilobites, as they went extinct millions of years ago, there have been trackways on the seafloor that look similar to fossilized trilobite tracks. They were found in 1967 and weren't officially identified. With how other living fossils like the coelacanth were discovered after being assumed to be extinct, it's possible that trilobites could maybe still be out there somewhere. Bifurd Dolphin Decompression Accident 
The Bifurt Dolphin was an oil drilling rig operated by Dolphin Drilling in the North Sea. And in 1983, it was the setting for one of, if not the worst diving accident in history. This story involves four saturation divers. So for those that don't know, saturation divers are professional divers who dive to depths greater than 500 feet to work on things like underwater pipelines or oil rigs. But in order to avoid decompression sickness, the divers are required to spend a long time down there. Saturation divers will spend up to 28 days underwater living inside a pressurized chamber where they eat and sleep between shifts. This job pays about $40,000 a month though, in case the prospect of living in a cramped pod at the bottom of the ocean for a month didn't already sell you on it. But anyway, because they work so deep, they would have to swim to the surface for days to avoid decompression sickness. So instead, there are specialized decompression chambers for every 100 feet that the divers are shuttled to by a pressurized diving bell. To properly decompress, they are expected to stay in these chambers for one day each. This is only after the job is finished, however. Most of the time, they stay inside a hyperbaric chamber that maintains their bodies at the same pressure level as deep water. As you can probably guess, saturation diving is more complicated than I might be making it sound. It takes a whole crew to make an operation like this work, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. The Bifurt Dolphin had two living chambers that were connected to each other and a diving bell that would bring divers to the first chamber. On November 5th, 1983, the diving bell successfully connected to chamber 1 and deposited two divers while the other two were resting in chamber 2. The diving tenders outside the chamber were working to get the diving bell back to the surface, but disaster struck when the diving bell detached before the doors were closed. This created an explosive decompression as the pressure inside the chambers instantly went from 9 atmospheres to just 1. The divers inside the living chambers were killed instantly, as the sun change in pressure caused the nitrogen in their blood to erupt out of their bodies, essentially boiling them from the inside. The diver closest to the door connecting the bell was sucked through the narrow opening, tearing him open. The two tenders were both struck by the diving bell when it was sent flying by the rush of air out of the chamber. This killed one of them and critically injured the other. The lives of these men were tragically taken because of one little mistake. Afterwards, the Norwegian government, who was operating the Bifurt Dolphin at this time, refused to take responsibility for the accident for 26 years until they finally provided restitutions to the families of the six victims. In the first episode of this series, or whatever you'd call it, I said how impressive it is that we have the technology that makes it possible for us to do something like get a human being to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. I still believe this to be extremely impressive, but I feel that some people out there mistakenly believe that this kind of technology makes us more powerful than the ocean, or that it gives us some kind of control over nature. It should go without saying, but I find this kind of thinking to be monstrously arrogant and dangerous. If you look at all those voyages to the bottom of the ocean that were successful, you'll find out just how much research, testing, training, engineering, manpower, trial and error, combined intelligence, scrapped ideas and prototypes, money, time, blood, sweat, tears, and failures, it all took just to get a single person to the seafloor for like 20 minutes. These voyages worked because the people involved respected the power of the ocean and prepared for every possible contingency. The Bifurt Dolphin accident shows us how dire the consequences of getting just one thing wrong can be. I am by no means an expert, but I can confidently say that's why the Ocean Gate Submersible failed. Stockton Rush didn't respect the power of the ocean or the dangers present. He thought that he could control and outsmart nature by ignoring what should have been obvious warning signs and barely passing the bare minimum of what was required for the Titan submersible to function. He did it all to make it as affordable as possible, and it ended up costing him more than his company would have ever earned had the voyage to the Titanic been a success. I feel like because the ocean is on Earth, we assume it to be easy to explore when compared to space. It isn't. We have the International Space Station. We have never had an international underwater station in the deep sea. This is because there are just as many, if not more, unpredictable factors that would have to be accounted for to pull off such a feat of engineering. In the past 60 years, technology has gotten extremely advanced, 
but it's still not enough for us to avoid any unpredictable dangers. That's what I mean by what is uncontrollable will remain uncontrollable. I personally don't believe that technology will ever get to the point where it basically makes us gods who are able to control every aspect of the world around us. At least not any time in the foreseeable future. Besides, it's more likely that technology will have more control over us at that point. But until that existential scenario plays out, we'll have to continue to put up with the existential scenario that we're currently living through. That being the one where we are at the mercy of nature. And try as we might, there are some forces that we will never be able to control. And since I don't think we'll ever be able to control the ocean, why should I think that we'll ever know everything that's in it with absolute certainty? Sure, we know a lot about it, and we'll continue to learn more, but we'll never know everything. We can use what we do know from discoveries and fossils to fill in the gaps of our knowledge with educated guesses, but there will always be those unsolved mysteries left behind to taunt us. We continue diving in an ocean that seems to get deeper and deeper every time we think we're close to the bottom. I don't think we'll ever find out what waits for us just beyond the thick, dark fog of the abyss. But if we continue downward, we might just catch a fleeting glimpse of it. Why do people always assume that what's within the Black Seas of Infinity is some kind of eldritch evil that will destroy us? It could be something nice. I don't know. You don't know. None of us knows. Hey, it's the end of the video. Um... You can leave, but first I just want to kind of say thanks for watching. Um, I don't really have a script, I'm just recording this after, like, editing the whole video together. Just kind of at the last minute, so I'll keep it brief. So yeah, sorry this took a while. Uh, I'm not dead, I'm just, I'm just really slow. Part of that was kind of because that, that Davy Jones segment near the beginning that was going to be its own separate video, but I wasn't really all that happy with how it was turning out, so I decided to kind of just make it a segment in this iceberg. So that's why the audio in that segment is a little different. It's because I recorded it like two months before I recorded the audio for this video. So yeah, I learned my lesson from that. Uh, Probably not going to announce what my next video will be again, unless I know for sure that I can finish it. But yeah, thanks for watching. Um, thanks again to Alan Danker for the Underwater Abominable Snowman art. Uh, he did a really good job on it. Thanks to everybody who sent in an idea. I couldn't get to all of them, so sorry if you suggested something and I didn't talk about it in this video. But this video is getting long enough, so I, I should really just wrap it up. Oh, wait a second. It looks like there's one more entry. Who's talking? The skeleton or the fish? Well, like I said, the video is getting a little too long, so I'll try to explain it before my time is up. You see, 